I'd like to thank everyone, uh, you know, some zero the sponsors, the judges, the attendees on this call, and congratulate all the other winners. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, you know, my arc as an investor began with an event driven focus and has evolved to focus on long term compounders. Uh, I was prompted by, you know, considering Buffett's punch card metaphor that if you were limited to 20 investments over a lifetime, how would that influence your choices? as your holding period goes from a couple of years to decades. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, my style of investing and then we'll, we'll dive into Dino. Uh, so, you know, it's really an investment process that's based on three first principles. Competition drives returns, that the average business in a competitive market should, you know, be lucky to earn its cost of capital. Uh, only a business protected from competition can earn excess rents barring regulation. Incentives determine outcomes that in the long run, capital allocation is a key value driver. And so the alignment of management uh, is a, a big component of value add. And a long horizon is a durable advantage. The time favors the exception of business due to the mechanics of compounding, separating the wheat from the chaff. So the investment goal uh, here is pretty straightforward. It's essentially to generate private equity-like returns uh, without taking leverage risk uh, you know, in the public markets. And so what I'm looking for in investment are the criteria that you would expect for looking for quality business to hold for a long period of time. Uh, you know, what's notable is sort of the, you know, how the importance or, or the perspective on margin of safety shifts. It's still critically important, but there's a shift from looking at margin of safety being driven from sort of the, the quantitative metrics of a you know, near-term discount to um, intrinsic value to really focusing on a margin of safety driven by the high confidence in a much larger future intrinsic value. And that's driven by the qualitative factors relating to the quality of the business. So moving on to Dino Polska, uh, which is a grocery store operator in Poland uh, that has a unique business model. First, let's just do a, a little bit to discuss what makes Poland a somewhat unique market. Uh, here's Poland surrounded by its neighbors. Uh, notably, it has a large border with Ukraine, which has been a, a significant factor over the last couple of years following Russia's aggression. Uh, approximately 2 million Ukrainians uh, migrated into to Poland, uh, which has, has had some impact, positive and negative, on the economy there. And, you know, going forward, certainly, uh, you know, the outcome of that conflict will, will have a big factor on, on the, the regional economy. Um, you know, Poland has been a great success story since the fall of communism, uh, you know, 35 uh, years ago. Uh, GDP per capita has risen sixfold over that time. Um, and one of the things that's notable about Poland is that 73% of the population is outside the cities. Uh, so it's a very distributed population. Uh, and, you know, here is another way of looking at that as a density map with the darker colors being uh, more dense and the lighter colors being less dense, that you see a good portion of the population is, is spread out in small towns and rural areas. And that ties in, we'll see, uh, very directly with, with Dino's unique model. Um, here you can see GDP per capita for select countries in Europe. Um, Poland is fifth on this list with the potential, some say, to surpass uh, the UK over the next decade. Uh, a little bit about the grocery market in Poland. Uh, you know, it's 400 billion uh, Polish slotties, which is about 100 billion US. Uh, Dino has a relatively small share, even just adjusting for the rural markets in which they operate in. The share is still, you know, high single digits with a lot of runway for, for future growth. The Polish grocery customer is somewhat unique in that the, um, due to the fact that the homes are small, there's limited storage for both pantry and refrigeration, uh, you have a very price sensitive customer and, and you know, gas is very expensive. So you know, the typical customer is going in multiple times a week uh, with an average ticket of $10 US. Um, and so this unique factors of the customer as well as the population distribution really supports Dino's position in their tagline, which I won't attempt to read the Polish, but it translates into closest to you. So they're proximity markets. Um, and they believe that a store can be profitable 
with a catchment area of only 2,000 people within one kilometer radius, which is really pretty exceptional. Um, you know, what makes Dino unique? Uh, the business has shown great economics and capital allocation early on. Uh, you know, it took in a private equity investment, uh, you know, uh, about a, you know, 15 some years ago. Uh, and those funds were used to buy the land, which has supported the, uh, the continued store growth. When private equity wanted uh, an exit, when the sponsor wanted an exit, they did the IPO, which was essentially secondary. Dino raised no capital in that. And aside from a you know, small amount of, of debt capital, this business has had a self-financing flywheel uh, for growth from you know, the, the very uh, beginning. The, uh, the founder owns 51% of the share, the public float represents, you know, that that piece that was liquidated. Uh, founders never sold a share. Uh, there is no stock compensation, although they they're offering cash compensation on the metrics that, you know, one would expect and want for for a high quality uh, compounding business. Uh, but there's no there's no dilution risk here. Uh, a little bit more about the stock. You know, it's. These are smaller footprint grocery stores in rural and suburban Poland. They're, you know, 400 square meters or about 4,400 4, square feet, small number of SKUs. Dino owns and builds each store. And the leverage from the standardized format has really been a key to their success in driving very high returns across the board. Uh, the fast growth, combined with the fact that stores take several years to season, masks the earnings power and makes the stock look optically expensive. But there's lots of headroom for further growth. Um, my investment thesis is really straightforward. There's a structural cost advantage here. And as the business grows, they get a scale uh, advantage in particular due to purchasing power that uh, they, they get leverage with the, uh, the manufacturers for discounts. There's a long runway for reinvestment. Uh, scale makes the economics even better and widens the moat. Um, and you have an aligned management team with a very strong track record of, of capital allocation. Um, and so, you know, this goes into greater detail on the structural competitive advantage of the business. You know, they own the meat processor. They're vertically integrated from, you know, my understanding is from pig to sausage, uh, and they have meat counters in every... Uh, store, which is a competitive advantage that a lot of the independents and even some of the larger firms simply can't match. And this is, you know, understandably resulted in rapid store growth of stores, you know, 2000 stores uh, over the last you know, decade in, in growth. And you can see how they've expanded, um, you know, from the uh, west into the east and the density you, know, you can see as stores take you know three years to season, the DCs probably take you know four to five years to season. Uh, so there's a lot of latent earnings power uh, just from getting the uh, the seasoning, let alone additional growth. And this you know that seasoning provides a natural lift to LFL sales, which have um, you know like for like sales have consistently been very strong in this business. Um, and here is a sample store, very simple, small footprint on a rather small plot of land um, on the outskirts of town where two roads converge, small parking lot. Uh, because Dino owns their stores, they've been able to you know, do initiatives like, you know, on the far side of this roof is filled with solar panels. And so they're able to, you know, make those investments, recapture those over a long time frame um, and, and compound their cost advantage. It's something that you know you simply would be very challenged to do if you were leasing the location. And again, mentioned feature is the fresh meat counter. Uh, you know this looks simple, but it presents significant logistical and labor challenges. Uh, smaller independents can't compete, and there's an advantage over the larger competitors that aren't vertically integrated. Uh, the meat counters are important given the the predominance of meat in the Polish diet and the consumer perception that you know, meat behind glass is uh, of higher quality and fresher than packaged meat in a, in a cooler. So here's, here's the real you know, earnings engine. This is uh, looking at a store model. We had 
looking at a store as if it's fully seasoned after three years at the current EBITDA margins, which are really determined by the aggregate level of, of sales and purchasing power. And you're seeing returns in capital employed you know, in the low to, to mid 40s. Uh, this provides a self-financing um, you know, engine for, for future growth. And I think that stores could easily grow by 13% compounded over the next dozen years. Uh, leading store growth in 2035, that's, you know, uh, four times uh, what it is today. And looking to the, the comp competition and the competitive dynamics in the market, and, you know, Bedronco, which is owned by a Portuguese conglomerate, uh, they are, are the strongest and uh, largest competitor to Dino. They have a 22% share overall with you know, about 50% uh, more stores. These stores are larger, they are leased, and there's more SKUs. Uh, they primarily operate in urban markets, uh, but they are expanding into rural and small towns. Uh, the discounters uh, have done well, uh, but not the big box ones, uh, mainly because I think of, of petrol and storage costs just make them a poor fit for the Polish consumer. And the mom and pops, the independents, are, are really the ones that uh, the growth is being taken from as a you know structural competitive disadvantage. Looking again, you know, more closely at Bedronka versus Dino, uh, Bedronka is four times their size in terms of revenue. They have you know a, a you know margins that are fifty basis points lower. We think that's actually really misleading. That uh, Dino has a structural competitive margin advantage from two factors. One, they, they don't do any marketing, and that's you know maybe about a hundred basis point lift. But by renting uh, the stores, Bedronka is probably spending about four hundred basis points of, of revenue uh, on rental expense that Dino avoids. So together, you know, Dino at comparable scale should be able to see a lift of you know four hundred plus basis points. Uh, and I think possibly more coming over the next, um, you know, five to 10 years as they continue to scale up. And that's going to, con you know, that's really where, what the widening of the moat is going to be driven from. Uh, you know, Bedronka um, and Toronto Martins have operations in, in other countries. So it's, it's not, you know, uh, we're not able to get too granular with it. But if you, you know, look at the value drivers, you know, both businesses are reinvesting, you know, substantial portion, uh, you know, and slightly excessive of their income back into the business. But, you know, the difference in the structural competitive advantage of Dino is really highlighted by the returns on incremental invested capital they're receiving that are, you know, approximately, you know, just about five times what, uh, what JMT is able to deliver. And, you know, that is uh, an advantage that, you know, compounds greatly over time, separating the wheat from the chaff. That, um, you know, we, we think that's, that's a real key factor in, in how Dino is, is going to, you know, survive and, and thrive uh, over the next uh, several years. Here's a you know graphic example of positioning. So this is you know a significant you know a city of significant size in in Poland. You see the Bedronka locations are largely concentrated in the urban center, and the Dino locations you'll see a few of them on the outskirts. Uh, so they they do compete head to head uh, in places, but largely their their at present is not um, you know pure overlap. Um, you know, it's it's rational and likely for Dino to enter the cities eventually, perhaps prior to entering other countries. And I and I do understand their their research and concepts. So getting on to what this is worth, you know, the operating expenses are not where the leverage is. Uh, you know, it's all in the cost of goods sold, and you know that should shrink with scale as purchasing leverage commands greater greater discounts. Um, here's a model of seasoning the stores, and what's notable is that. You know, because the stores, uh, you know, because they're having a high growth and the stores take three years to season, it really means that from a reported basis, given their growth, that the effective number of stores is about 15% lower than the actual number of stores. Um, and that gap, you know, is just naturally going to correct over time as those stores get seasoned, providing further lift to earnings power and, and cash flow. Uh,
you know, the value drivers here are, are pretty basic. It's new store growth. And, you know, the challenge there is, you know, right now they're operating at about one new store a day. As they get that to, you know, two stores a day or, or Brayer coming online, you know, there are going to be some logistical uh, challenges to that and, and how they're able to, to do that is sort of a key factor that, you know, try to get more, more detail on. The margin expansion is kind of locked in. That's just going to naturally with scale as it does for, for any other retailer. And we think the lift there is substantial. And the capital allocation, you know, provides uh, some margin of safety because if, if they do choose to pause the store growth, and they have slowed down a bit over the last two years because of the disruption in the market due to the events in Ukraine, um, cash, you know, store growth slows, the cash builds, they, they you know, we trust them to, to be prudent in how they manage through that as they have in the past. Um, again, you know, this, this model leads to store growth that could be, you know, uh, four, four X over the next dozen years, uh, with a lot of runway for future growth. We think that if they just stay in the urban rural markets, there's probably, um, you know, 11 to 12,000, uh, stores just in Poland. If they ultimately go into the cities, which I expect, you know, that could probably add a couple thousand more stores. So there's a lot of headroom for, for future growth. And so how we look at valuation, you know, so if you look at the current store portfolio in a steady state format at current margins, you know, you're getting a after-tax free cash flow yield of, you know, high fours to, to mid 5%, which is, you know, 150 basis points plus over the 10 year treasury. Uh, you know, the stock is, is not, uh, you know, a, um, you know, a, an amazingly, uh, inexpensive, but it's a reasonable, you know, entry valuation, even at today's price, which has run up, you know, a fair bit over the last several months. Uh, what could it look like in the next five to 10 years? You know, this is where, again, the drivers are store growth and margin expansion due to scale, uh, assuming no change in, in valuation multiples. Uh, so it's strictly, you know, betting on growth. And you can see the ability to compound in high teens uh, over the next five or 10 years, which uh, with, with relatively little uh, execution uh, risk and, you know, and no financing risk. And the optionality, uh, you know, again, we think they're likely to keep focusing on what's working in the rural and small towns. Eventually they could enter, you know, the cities, further leveraging their distribution network. Ultimately, there are international opportunities uh, primarily in Eastern Germany and Slovakia, but perhaps in, in other countries as well. And, uh, you know, so the summary of the thesis, you know, uh, again, is, is pretty straightforward. It's a quality business run by competent management with proper incentives. Uh, the things that are uh, outside management's control uh, aren't uh, terribly meaningful to, to where we think the outcomes might be, and, and that gives additional comfort and sleeping at night with, with a, a concentrated position uh, with a long time horizon. And so, you know, thank you for the opportunity to present. Please reach out to me directly to discuss Dino or other investments or to learn more about uh, my strategy. All right, great, thanks, Chris. Um, so first question in the chat, does Dino actually have a competitive advantage as scale is crucial and competitors are far bigger in revenue terms and are also opening as many stores annually. If own, owning stores in a meat processing plant was really a durable moat, why haven't other players done this? You know, I, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I th honestly, you know, I think in these situations, the differentiating, differentiating factor is culture, right? You know, why why isn't there... Uh, a competitor that is, you know, outshone, you know, Costco, right? It's, uh, there's no secrets in retail. You know, everybody sees what you're doing. Everybody can walk into your stores. Um, you know, in theory, there should be no competitive advantage uh, to be claimed. And, and that certainly is true for the vast majority of, of competitors. But for, there's a select few that have carved out business models that are somewhat unique and that go against uh, traditional, you know, industry concepts. And it's surprising how few 
uh, people will look at them, see their success, and not elect to mimic it. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it took a while to sort of realize that, you know, culture, which doesn't seem, you know, as, as solid and finite of an advantage uh, compared to, you know, say, looking at something that is, you know, a deep discount to asset value or, or uh, you know, a, a deep discount to normalized earnings power. Uh, that it seems like a weak remote, but if you're extending your time horizon out to decades, you realize that those are actually where the strongest moats moats come from. Great. Um, so staying on the comp side of things, are there examples of companies with a similar business model? Um, you know, Dollar General, Aldi, how do they source their products more cost effectively compared to competitors? Um, you know, I think... The there's a couple you know structural advantages, right? One is you know again if you if you look to Costco, you know part of Costco's advantage lies in having a very limited number of SKUs. So there's there's fewer slots for merchandise, and there's greater buying power uh, for the merchandise that goes in those slots. So being more valuable to the the, the uh, manufacturers, there's you know, the willingness to offer, you know, deeper discounts on a smaller number of products than to do so on, you know, a, a wider range of products for which there's lesser demand. Uh, so that's simply one. Um, and then just naturally, you know, a lot of it just goes to, to, to scale. But we think, you know, because there's smaller format stores, they're generally dealing with national brands, not, not so, you know, there's, there's some international and global brands, but largely it's national brands. Uh, there's no private label as of yet, um, but they're, they're you know, doing uh, a pretty good job on the sourcing. And we think that's a, um, that's a value driver that is naturally just gonna expand with scale. Okay. Um, well, I guess one question from me actually, Chris, is like, how do you think about this term in terms of like FX risk potentially? Um, you know, obviously the Polish currency is held pretty stable against the euro for the last 10 years, but, um, you know, that could, that could be subject to the whims of the market, right? But would be curious to kind of know, you know, more about sort of your, your approach to that, that side of that on the, on the risk management side. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if I, you know, if I had an edge in forecasting, you know, exchange rates or interest rates, you know, I'd be in a different business. So it's not, it's not a core competency of mine by, by a long stretch. And so we don't uh, do anything to, to hedge currency, um, you know, and the belief there is that, you know, while it could be a risk in the short run, the hope is that it's, it's less of a risk in the long run that it sort of washes out, um, you know, clearly there can be risks over, uh, you know, over shorter time frames there, but it's not, you know, it's not the, um, it's not a key factor in in the investment analysis. And you know, I'm by far from a knowledgeable expert on, you know, Polish um, uh, government, but you know, we're encouraged by you know the recent uh, you know wins of of a more liberal democratic. Um, government over what had been a, a pretty right wing uh, conservative environment. So we're, we're you know, encouraged at the future uh, of, of the Polish economy. You know, clearly the, the big risk factor in the near term is going to be, you know, uh, does does the world stand up to uh, to the Kremlin and and stop Russian aggression before it spreads to okay. uh, the border with NATO? All right. There are Last question. There are 12,000 grocery stores in the UK. How do you see DP reaching 10,000 stores in a smaller market, given that the population is 30% smaller? Well, again, it's the nature of the stores, right? I mean, it's it's probably better to, you know, you, you have to look at stores in terms of store count, but you're also looking at stores in terms of square footage, and you have to look at stores as unique to the, uh, the demographics of, of the country. So, you know, again, the fact that is, you know, somewhat unique in Dino's case is that you have in Poland a, a very distributed population. You know, if, if it was all urban, you don't need 10,000 stores. Uh, but the fact that it's very distributed, 
you can get away with that. It's, you know, I, I would sort of look at Starbucks, you know, the same question was, was made of like, you know, how does Starbucks go from X number of stores to two X or three X or five X stores over time? And, you know, it's, if you have an efficient store model where, you know, you can, where the stores can survive on a very small catchment area population, you know, that, uh, and have good economics, uh, you know, really good economics in, in those locations, you can afford more stores. If you can't get there, and, and I suspect that Bedronka can't get there, and I certainly suspect that the average store can't get there, then, then those, you know, businesses can't support that growth. But we think the, the Dino concept, uh, you know, again, it's simple, it's replicable, uh, if anybody else would chose to do it, but most don't. And we think, you know, the unique factors of it are really what allows for the, uh, the opportunity to scale. Okay. Yeah, I know I said last question, but I, I guess we do have a couple minutes extra, Chris, if yeah. you don't looking around for a little bit more. Um, yeah, of course. So how does this company compare in terms of price versus competitors and key SKUs, for example, you know, meet where integration provides a margin advantage? Yeah. So the way the way that you know Dino looks at it is that they have they have a basket of goods that are, are sort of high velocity uh, items, and they they benchmark the prices to the discounters. So they try to stay very price competitive. Um, and you know, I think there are other areas then where they maybe are able to get you know a little bit more margin. They they tend not to be you know terribly promotional. It's it's really the idea. Of, of sort of everyday low prices, you know, they're not running flyers, they're not doing marketing. Um, you know, I think there might be, you know, some something in the store where they talk about uh, you know, promoting, you know, maybe some specials, but generally speaking, you know, they're not a promotional retailer. That's not the model. And so, uh, you know, they're our understanding, you know, and, and what we've heard from, uh, you know, research of people that have done, you know, price comparison shopping on the ground, is is that they're very price competitive with their with their competitors on uh, competitors on the key items uh, in most customers' baskets. Great, thanks for that. Um, why do store economics not deteriorate as growth four times the store base over the forecast period? From a density perspective, is there really capacity or demand in that market to support ten thousand dino stores as well as expansion from the market leader? Excluding rent, does the market leader not obtain superior economics? And how will they finance this store growth and land purchases? Yeah, so uh, those are all good questions. You know, I think what's what's unique about Dino is that the the store model is is so strong that it's self financing, and you know, and so that's going to be able to drive growth, and with that growth in scale. You get the purchasing power leverage, which you know turns that flywheel to get more margin and more cash flow. And so, you know, it's it's harder looking at Bedronka because you're you're only getting segment reporting. So you're getting revenues and an EBIT and CapEx, but you're not getting you know more granular detail on on gross margins and whatnot. So we're making some estimates there. But yeah. you know, in in short, the estimates are that Bedronka, albeit a, a very strong competitor, um, you know, is, uh, is more challenged in, in their operating model, that they're not able to sustain that sort of growth that can keep pace with, um, with Dino over the long term, uh, unless they're able to somehow improve their model. That, uh, you know, and it does seem that competition is increasing a bit. It does seem that Bedronka is building new stores in the rural uh, areas, in, in some cases right next to Adino. We have some examples of that. They're in the pitch that made it on the um, on the website. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, shifting competitive dynamics there. But, you know, in short, we think that, you know, the, the Dino model is superior, that time and scale will further reveal that, and that over time, you know, Dino will, will have a structural advantage over Bedronka, and that I think in five to ten years out, uh, while Bedronka will still be a significant competitor, uh, it's likely that Dino will be of larger scale, and and viewed as the as the clear leader with Bedronka, 
you know, in, in second and, and with that gap widening further over time. 